Hello, um, I am Hitoshi Abe, Chair of the Department of Architecture and Urban Design. Uh, I'm very honored to have tonight's speaker of our department. And uh, we haven't really officially announced yet, but uh, actually we are welcoming 50th year anniversary of the department. And it is interesting that uh, when I talk to uh, different people, they say, some people say, no, it's officially from 64. Some people say, no, it's 66. So um, um, what I learned is actually the official start of the program is 64, and then the real kind of a beginning is more likely the 66. So that actually gives us a little bit of uh, time so that we can say maybe we'll celebrate the 60s, 50th year anniversary next year. And uh, that means uh, we want to invite many alumni back to the school and we really want to turn, take up this opportunity to, to turn this anniversary as a big thing. So that means actually uh, there's a lot of excitement happening around the department. And also, we really want to create this opportunity for you to learn the history of this school and many things happened in the past. Also, tours actually. No, actually, then there was a kind of meeting with our alumni, and then they said that we should really turn this 50s year towards more future looking, not just looking at the past. So, I'm very excited about actually learning and also working together our, our alumni group to think about the future. And with this said, that, that actually tonight's guest is perfect to talk about the future and uh, to talk about 50s year anniversary. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our girl, tonight's speaker, and tonight's uh, uh, 2013 Hoping Distribution distinguished alumni. Actually, this uh, distinguished alumni series was established 2009, and uh, we actually invited uh, so many actually our distinguished alumni back to our department, including Anna Burton and Frederick Fisher, Lee Fan and Lee Chen, and uh, so many. And uh, uh, I'm very uh, privileged and uh, so honored to introduce him tonight. Our Gale is a, a 1994 graduate of UCLA Architecture and Urban Design with Master of Architecture. Our graduate thesis at UCLA, actually this is a information I got, so hopefully it's right. An integrated rail network for Metropolitan Los Angeles, and it's a formed one of the critical documents in the federal funding package for the Los Angeles Material System. In 1972, he received his bachelor's degree in urban and regional planning from Calcoli Pomona. Gail is chairman and CEO of Jenkins and Gales and Martinez Inc., specializing in program, project, and construction management, urban planning, and architecture design in the field of transportation infrastructure civic and educational and institutional and residential and commercial facilities serving Southern California and most recently Beijing. With more than 120 employees, it is one of the largest minority-owned certified, certified firm in the field. Uh, Al has been at the forefront of public transportation policy and uh, implementation for more than 25 years. He played a significant, significant role in the revitalization of Los Angeles region, including directing or uh, partnering on important civic projects, including the redevelopment of the Bunker Hill dis uh, District, the Staples Center, the LA Convention Center, and Exposition Park, as well as underserved communities throughout Los Angeles and Orange County. Having served on the U.S. Vice President Commission on the National Infrastructure, Al's reputation in this vital field is well known. And there's a really long list of the 
Folge of Nice supposed to be, but I can't pronounce when we started. So he did lots of lots of projects in church. And he has served as an advisor to two US presidents on transportation and infrastructure development and has advised two governors in mentorship and volunteer service. So there's a lot to say about him, but without further ado, please join me in welcoming our girls this evening. First off, I'd like to thank UCLA, thank uh, Mr. Hitoshi for inviting me here. I thought several times about <clears throat> what can I say to make this exciting, what can I say to make this interesting. So I'm not going to talk about a lot of our projects, I'm going to talk about the method by which we collaborate and work on projects. We're extremely different than any firm that's, I think, that's ever been built. My background is essentially urban design, although I came with the understanding that I wanted to be strictly into uh, the building field. I wanted to follow my father, who was a carpenter, and I said, no, I want to change uh, strictly into the architectural field. Then I said, no, actually, planning fits me better. Planning and urban design fits me a little bit better. And I wanted to develop a comprehensive firm, a firm that did as many things possible, but concentrated in certain areas. And the areas that we concentrated in was transportation um, and healthcare. And um, in transportation, it was in um, airports, ports and harbors, and, and also subways. Um, did anyone ever see the picture of the jerk? I was born a poor little black boy. This is, <laughs> I wanted to start off by this, because this picture my brother just gave to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it kind of meant something. That's me and that's my brother. We were actually, uh, and uh, this house is, this picture is important for two reasons. Um, my father built a home in the rear, he built the home to the, to the right that was a move-on home. That gave me an introduction to, to the field of, of uh, construction, design, and just hard work. Right in the front of where my brother and I are actually looking is the tracks of Watts. And <clears throat> this particular thing, there was three things that changed my life, and I'm going to get into those three things today. It also changed the way I looked at planning, the way I looked at design, the way I looked at the environment. And one of the things was this picture here. It was this picture uh, because my mother used to do domestic work for about two years. And she would go to take the red car, which is now the blue line there, and she went to work at a lady's house named Eve Arden. She was an actress at the time. And my mother would leave the house at 5, uh, <clears throat> 5.30 in the morning to go do domestic work at this lady's house. And I was always wondering why would my mother leave so early when Eve Arden was saying you cannot enter her house until 8 o'clock, and my mother would arrive at 6.30. It's because, well, first of all, you know, Eve Arden is no longer here, so I wouldn't fit on her. But she was a very difficult lady. But the reason why my mother had to leave, and all the other ladies had to leave early, is because the red line would only stop in Watts during the early mornings and in the uh, late mornings because there was an express that took you from Long Beach into downtown Los Angeles. It never stopped in Watts. So if you were a patron there, you would, I mean, if you were a domestic worker, 
you have to get to work very early. And so that always bothered me. Why in the world would a system like ours, an excellent transportation system, you would allow others to uh, not have an opportunity to take the system? That's the way it was. People had accepted. And remember at that time, LA had the best transportation system in the entire nation. We had a system that would take you from uh, from Watts to Santa Monica to the beach. And it was absolutely the best system ever. I had said at that time that uh, I would devote all of my time and effort to understanding how the urban environment works, how does transportation work, how does design work, how does planning work. And a lot of it came out of ignorance and fear, how planning came. And I would do every study, even my study here, when I first entered UCLA, was a paper that essentially was the initial document that got the Metro Rail project funded. It was the needs analysis that I started in undergraduate school that I kept refining class after class. If I had an urban um, design class, I did it on transportation. If I had an urban social class, I did it on transportation, urban economics, everything. I had an urban law uh, class over in the School of Law here. It was all about transportation. I felt I knew more about how um, the transportation system died, how it survived, and who were the main people that were involved in it. And one guy told me, Kenny Hahn was a supervisor here, you know, he was a, um, he was, uh, he said, follow the dollar, where the dollars were. Well, I mean, if you look at it, you saw where Walt Disney, if you can remember when, a lot of you can't, but when Disney first started, there was a thing called Utopia. Utopia, yeah, was where they had the little cars running. That was funded by the oil companies, the rubber companies, and the auto companies to make sure that our environment looked at the way we treated transportation. The new way was freeways and cars. The bad way was a fixed rail system that we had. And if you looked who dedicated the money to the program, it was mainly the oil companies, the rubber companies were supporting the, um, let's say the, the various city uh, agencies that were uh, pro and against transportation. So I said at that time, this changed my life. I dedicated most of my time to understanding and knowing where transportation comes in at. The second thing that I met that changed my life that I worked for, I'm going to get rid of this slide and get kind of tired of looking at myself. Um, I'm not going to talk about myself some of the projects that we've worked on. But the second thing that changed my life was meeting Mr. Charles Luckman. Charles Luckman was an architect in LA. He was a, um, probably one of the top architects at the time. And in undergraduate school, I decided that I needed a job other than working in uh, the market as a checker. And I went to go work for Charles Luckman's office. And at, and at that time, he was on Wilshire Boulevard, I mean, he was on San, um, Sunset uh, Boulevard at the end there. And in doing that, I was doing like folding details, I was doing other things that involved um, store planning. And store planning at that time was, we were doing Broadway Hell stores. I came in and I had looked at the way Charles Luckman did business. Uh, uh, Charles at that time, Mr. Luckman, I never called him Charles, would never go into the production office. One day he did while I was sitting uh, at, at my desk. And they started taking pictures of me, basically of me on a drafting board just holding the, the pen. He was doing some production uh, pictures for, uh, uh, so the firm can go for the LA Convention Center project. They ultimately won that. I got a chance to meet Mr. Luckman more because uh, every, everyone else was, uh, was afraid of him. And he was not, he just didn't come in the production office at, at that time. What happened later on 
I went to meet him at the airport. At that time, our, some, some architects had chauffeur-driven cars. Mr. Luckman was one of those. He had a driver that drove him around. He, he was on one floor. Everyone else was on, on another floor. It was, a, it was a different way how architects were at the time. So Mr. Luckman came, comes to me. We pick him up in the car at the airport, and we're driving into uh, L.A. He didn't know me from a can of paint. And he says, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm the guy you took the production pictures with. And uh, he started telling me about his life, that he was a Lieber brother salesman, and what do I like in architecture, what I don't like. And uh, I come to, oh, I want to be a designer. I want to be a great designer, although I like production drawings. Well, I want to be a great designer. He said, when you were in school, were there guys in a class that were better than you? I, uh, I looked around, and I said, yes, it was. I thought I was a good designer. But no, there was about four or five other people that were, they were excellent. They were excellent. They, they can define a design very, very easily. I, I could not. It took me longer to define that. He said, when you get up, when you hire those people, and you make them part of you, and you, and you find a part of this business that make you happy, the part of the design business that I felt that I was comfortable in is in the sales part of the business, the business part of of architecture where most people fail at. And he says, Earl, that's the problem with architects. We fail in the business side of life. And I said, well, I said, uh, for, for that point on, I said, I will understand how things work, how architects work, how it takes to make a, 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 a project work, how design work. And I knew then that I had to look around to augment my talent by having others with greater talents. So, for example, Craig Hodges is doing work for us, and I'll get into that later on. Craig's a great designer. He's better than what we have. And what, but we can collaborate with great designers in the way our firm is, is, uh, is, is structured. This is a project here. I'm not going to go too much into the project, but this is the uh, Corona City Hall project that our firm did. Uh, we we, we love the job. It was a great job. Uh, I think we were about 10% under budget on, on the project. And we were about a half a year early in the, uh, in, in the project. We won a couple of, of awards for it, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was a great effort for us. But part of this, I'm not going to get into that, this project. This is another one that our firm did. It was the YWCA downtown. We were very proud of this because it was the only high rise at the time that had a crane downtown in the last couple of years that was under uh, construction. Uh, uh, we're very proud of it. It's a terrible picture of it, but it's, it's a better looking building than that. Uh, in the early, in, in the mid 70s, what we did was, uh, not mid 70s, but in the, um, in, in the 90s, late uh, 80s, um, we start, I started doing a lot of urban design work in China. Uh, part of the firm was working on uh, Ontario, I mean Ontario airports such as Mark and others. Uh, part of the firm was doing design work, doing urban design work. I got this work because going to China one time, my wife and I, uh, was my first visit to China. We met a guy there that was a guy. He, uh, he, he, was, uh, he, was, he was a business major, but also had as an architectural major. He then became the director of planning for, for the area. We started, he started hiring me to do design work for them. Not necessarily architectural work, but urban design work. So we started doing a number of set projects there. We had about 20 people only doing urban design work in uh, Shenzhen, Canton uh, area, uh, and eventually about 10 years later on we did a project that was in this, this is, and well, later on we did a project that, that I'll show you. Uh, we did an urban design effort in uh, uh, Beijing. This is a project that we did uh, a, a layout for, which was only meant to house uh, about 10,000 people. It ultimately went after 
China changed, the development changed, um, and we and now it, it uh, uh, the developer cookie cutter cookie cut cookie cut our design throughout the entire project. But we have open areas there, yeah, which I had the scheme before. Um, but we have open areas, open space, and all of a sudden he says, "No, no, I'm going to take your plan." We're going to cookie cut, cut her it out uh, 30 times. This project was ultimately uh, uh, stopped, but it, it was built, and they sent me some pictures recently of it, and it's under construction. This is a um, affordable housing project that's in Beijing, and instead of having four or five of these towers, now as you can see, it's the most crowded area uh, possible. Uh, this is the project that's under construction that they just uh, sent to me. This is a project that we started over 12 years ago. And the problem that we see in China, first of all, China cannot maintain a, um, a GNP of 10%. It's impossible for a nation to keep, to keep that up. Uh, China has, uh, has some, I have a lot of concern with China now because of the density. I have a, I have a problem because of China, because of the have and have nots. Uh, we're very concerned, so we're really not doing any more work in China. I was very concerned with the people that we ultimately uh, work with and we use over in the China area. Uh, more concerned about their safety, it's almost like a powder keg. So the investment that China's putting in now, they're trying to maintain that same GNP by investments over in, in, the, in, in the states here. Uh, the project that we received later on was an urban design uh, exercise. This was in the Donjimon uh, area, and this was a high-speed rail project. Oh, I can do this. It's a high high-speed rail center here, and this was a um, international hotel um, uh, office building project, condo project. And over here in the, in the second phase and the lower phase was a retail shopping center. Um, this project was, was uh, I found out later on, actually I found out a couple of weeks ago, it was ultimately built, and, uh, but it has twice the density that you may see on the property now. And the concern that we had when uh, Mark and others were uh, designing this lower level of the, the project. At the time, China had about 22% of their people uh, at that time were on bikes. Uh, now it's only 2% of the people were on bikes. We were designing something. If, before we can uh, finish one design, the whole fiber of the area changed substantially. That's the way China is. But now you see developments like this that are half empty, or just around the nation. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of concerned about it. And part of it that we see uh, comes on uh, the fear, uh, fear of the area. What the reason why we were selected early to do work in China wasn't because we were the best. It was because they wanted a U.S. firm to do work. Uh, they chose uh, uh, JGM or chose uh, uh, the group I was with because we were the Michael Jordans of the area. That's what they used to call us. Because they felt if we can survive in the U.S. doing work and uh, uh, the difficulty it is with working here, we should be fantastic working in their area. So I, I played upon that a lot. And when they say, oh, these are men, men but we but we had a, I mean, we, meaning U.S. companies over there, had a tremendous reputation of doing good work, but we had a tremendous reputation of being um, arrogant, pompous professionals. Uh, I seized upon that, and I became Jamaican. No, I'm just kidding with you. I, I kind of. I kind of seized upon that and felt myself that I would go over there uh, during the first part of the job and make sure that we were completed the job on time, we were completed to as, uh, 
as honest as we could. Now, in China, they give you a huge contract, a massive contract. You think that this is going to save your day and make your company very big. It doesn't in China because you work with a design institute. And the design institute is something that is owned by the Chinese government. And they will work with you until uh, they feel they can do the other project on their own. So when we were working there, we knew that, not necessarily, well, we knew it in this job here, although they signed us to a contract to do uh, the urban planning, the uh, urban design work, and the architecture, we would never get to the architecture. Because at that time, they were sophisticated enough in the design institutes to actually take your project over. And that's the way it was when we first started to work in, in, in uh, Canton and, and, and whatever. So we knew that. Most firms working over there was not aware of how Chinese, um, Chinese business worked. Um, so we worked on that project for a, uh, for a very long time. And um, I had looked at our firm as being different in a number of ways. And the most difficult thing for us, uh, our palette of work here in, in the States is strictly in the inner city, basically. Uh, we don't do a lot of work outside of the inner city. Uh, we try for work outside of there, but most of the work that we have is, of course, in South Central LA. It's, it's, in, it's in Los Angeles. Uh, so we have to fight very hard for that work when we're there, extremely hard for it. And we look at certain opportunities in LA that we must go for, but we also look at LA as failing in a lot of ways because of ignorance and, and fear of work that's in South Central LA. I'm going to bring three projects, not projects, three activities uh, in LA where we missed those opportunities in LA. One was on the Green Line, Blue Line uh, extension there. We told the MTA at that time that we really needed uh, to have an intersection that worked in that area. But when you have a blue line that was already built, you have a green line people that didn't talk to each other, and that's the only crossing station that MTA had, the design never worked. We were lucky enough to convince MTA later on because they are building this area in the worst crime district square block in the whole county of Los Angeles. And it's proven to be that. So why would I get in my, uh, on, on a red line, I mean on a green line at the airport, take my bags, go down three escalators down to the bottom level there, get on a blue line in the most heavily crimed area in LA and head to downtown. That made no sense. We told them from the beginning that you needed this crossing station, this environment that worked there. They didn't do it. We were lucky enough to get a contract of which we looked at our own talents internally. And that's when I say you have to know who you're working with. And we felt, yeah, no, we felt we were great. Mark and I and others looked at, no, we were, we were, we think we, we can, we're good designers, but we wanted to work with someone who we thought was a great architect. And so we worked with Craig Hodges on that. Craig, thank you to this day for working on that project uh, with us, which is still waiting to be built. And Craig can tell you some more about it. But we're gonna, we're, uh, that project is, is being built. It's one of the, uh, it's costing MTA maybe 10 times more than it should have cost uh, to uh, build. But that could have been a project that uh, really revitalized that area. You get 12,000 people crossing there uh, a day. Uh, you have a 70-foot elevation that you have to go through. It's it's a it's a tough design project that uh, that you have to uh, work on. Uh, an, an, another missed opportunity in LA because of fear, because of ignorance, is the Wilshire Alvarado Red Line station there, where it's a very shallow station, but it's a station that's going through. 
Uh, everyone looked at it and they hated that area. If you've gone around MacArthur Park, oh, it's a big crime area. We didn't look at it as that. We didn't look at it. We didn't fear that area. The, the square footage in that area is $80 a foot that those merchants are paying for uh, rent. That is higher than uh, Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is paying $68 to $72 a foot. That area is paying $80 a foot if you want to get some space in that area. Granted, that is smaller space. Uh, we looked at that as something that we could embrace, something that we could actually uh, take advantage of. MTA said no, and we backed away from that and told MTA uh, that. Now they built the station. It's a, um, they did put the great beams in that we told them to, and the project is going to cost about 20% more when the project's ultimately rebuilt after years. You have to embrace a project. The fear that our designers have, the fear that our planners have, is that this is in a low-income area. And the only reason I'm bringing that up at this time is because I was set on a panel a couple weeks ago here with the School of uh, Business and Law, and they were presenting their projects. And this was a project that's right off the Crenshaw in Inglewood. And it was eight different teams of about six uh, students on each team, six to eight students in each one. Uh, six of the projects decided that it was unfeasible to build a housing project in Inglewood. They, they did the economics of it. Ah, no, it doesn't work. We did our exercise and it was over. It was only two of those classes that looked at the area and felt the passion to get involved in. We can't do that. We can't walk away from jobs. We look at them. We look at those as opportunities in our firm where we can actually go out and collaborate with other funding sources, with other people, to try to get the project started. Um, the last project is 103rd and, um, and Graham Street. Down, of course, where you saw those two little kids there. It was only two blocks away from there. It was where the uh, Watch revolts started in 1964, just blocks away. Uh, that's where, uh, where we lived. We felt that that opportunity around that station should have been a main area for development along the blue line. And instead, what MTA did, just build a normal station. Just build a station for a stop. And I go back again after all these years and years and say, um, it's, I am back where I was when I was a little kid, five years ago, sitting in that little red wagon, wondering, are we changing, or is this environment different? Thank you. more proud of that than anything else that we uh, that 
I've done in my career. Uh, and in addition, you know, we're I'm on uh, the um, Gary K. Jenkins Scholarship at Penn State. We have um, three students that we hire from there. No, we have to have in the <laughs> so, so we brought them to, to work for us. Uh, Dan and others are still going to work for us. But um, I wish I could say my accomplishments were in the field of architecture. Uh, I really can't say that because um, we, we hire the talent. I, I am I'm part of that as a process. I'm very proud to say that uh, my, my head of architecture is here, Mark. Um, Mark is a great architect. We, um, you know, he's been able to, uh, he started with us doing, you know, Ontario Airport. Um, Mark has had a chance to, we've had a chance to work on some really unique projects. Um, I take my hat off to Mark because it's very difficult to work uh, with a firm like ours. Uh, Bob Kennard, who was, a, was another mentor of ours, says, Earl, I mean, I, I'm a 72-year-old I'm a man, and, and I never grew up in this business, and you'll never grow up in this business. I never understood what Bob meant until I'm in my 60s now, and I said, you're right. You know, we're, we aren't going to get the project that we worked on when I was with Charles Buckley, or when I was with Bill Ferreira's office or when we used to collaborate with Arthur Erickson. We, we were doing production drawings for Arthur here in LA. And Arthur was doing the design. We were doing uh, part of the production drawings for him. We did Cal Plaza and other projects. I did the planning for the central area there. That's because Arthur was a great designer. He was a great person, a great designer to actually work with. Um, you know, I kind of looked at that as that was the only innovative time we had in LA in terms of real urban design and real planning started. A lot of them, a lot of people felt that he was a little too advanced for the area. I felt by having these nodes and hooking these nodes up with transportation was a really good start. I think now with um, urbanization coming, the urban fabric coming more inside, I think a lot of our planning, and hopefully I'm trying to change part of that, more mixed use work should uh, happen in, in, in LA that we haven't embraced like other areas. It's still very difficult for us to talk about mixed use projects. We say it's fine, but yet we don't change the planning laws to adopt to that as quickly as other areas have. And if we don't do that, we're going to lose some great opportunities, especially in downtown especially in some of the outlying areas. Uh, we're no longer going to travel you know, 45 minutes to get into to LA. LA, is, LA will change, and it will change even quicker now with the economics changing in, in LA. With uh, you know, uh, housing prices are going to start going back up. You know, and, and that's going up not because of something that we're doing, it's because of outside investment. Changing as we are standing here now, but um, so that's one of the things that I saw. That, uh, we have to take a stronger look at transport, other other modes of transportation. Uh, we can no longer keep building the freeways the way we're doing, uh, doing it without 
really um, uh, combining other uses with it. It's, I don't care whether it's by rail, I don't care whether it's rapid bus. Um, we must change the fabric of our city here when it comes to uh, LA. I'm not a major component of how they're designing high speed rail now. Um, only because I, I figure that I felt that we can do it quicker and sooner by adding going on existing rail lines from LA to San Diego. We can use the, the right ways that are already there. We can do some we can do a lot of things that we aren't doing now. Uh, working working with the governor's office has been very difficult. You know, we were working with the governor when he first started and it was, it was just me, him and his wife were you know, we developed it. But now they've gone away from that. And so I think uh, uh, I think ways of transportation has changed, and I think ways that we look at the um, uh, way we legislate plans is going to have to change. We have to be more flexible in, in, in terms of the way we look at design, too, and the way we look at um, urban, um, urban uses. We, we aren't there yet. Uh, I think that we're getting there. I think we're now having some uh, brighter people that are in uh, public service. It's not like Herbert Perloff said when, when I was here. He said, you know, people remember in that last class, he said there'll be, there'll be a, a, a 30 you're going to go work for uh, public service. There's a 30 you're going to work for private. There's a 30 you're going to go do something entirely different. And he said, well, where do you stand in and, I, and those words always meant something to me, you know. I, I, and so, where did I go? I went to the safe part. You know, so I was working for the city of Los Angeles, working with Mayor Bradley. And, and when I worked in there, it wasn't how efficient we were in working. It's, it's the old widget theory, you know. It's the more people you have up under you, the more you get paid. It's not how efficient your staff works. It's just how many people you grab up. Where in private, work is the least amount of people with the most amount of widgets that you uh, produce. So I always felt at that time is that, um, you know, where did I fit, fit in there? So I went to the public side and gathered this big agency up, uh, you know, from eight people to, I think my, when I left, we had like 1,500 people. So I understood and I, I got paid accordingly. But being terminated from the city, uh, and I was terminated, I went to Mr. Bradley, and I said, uh, he said, Earl, I need to reduce your agency. And I said, no, you're not. I didn't realize you were going to talk to a mayor like that. He, he, he asked me, and I had to go find a job at the time, you know. But I loved Dr. Bradley to, the, to, the, uh, to every day of his life. He was the, the best man I've ever met in my life. That was one of the, the third experiences I'm going to tell you, is actually meeting him, actually having an opportunity to kind of work very, very closely with him. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, rambling. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we, we were active on the high speed rail program from here to LA. And let me come in here from LA to San Francisco. And uh, uh, I got into a lot of arguments and discussions with the government. The only reason why that system, I'm going to cut across the whole line, the only reason why that system was nominated first because of environmental reasons. There's less right away there, there's less people to uh, involve. If you build that right away first, the people will come. They'll say, oh, I am jealous because I'm going to get to Santa Barbara, to Fresno, or wherever it's going, to no place. And they would look at that and be jealous. And when I told him, that's not the case. Now. People do not act that way. You, you have to look at developing a transportation system that, that takes you from LA to San Diego, or that takes you from uh, San Francisco to Sacramento. You need to destination points that people utilize. The problem that we had is that the biggest lobbyist in Southwest Airlines at the time, and the governor was nervous. He didn't want to fight Southwest Airlines, but he put all of this Maybe I'm saying something I shouldn't say, but he, he said, hey, look, I, I, I want to take that fight. If I build a system here in Central California, 
everyone would be uh, falling all over themselves to now connect that system up on both ends. And I thought it was a, <coughs> it was a not the right decision. And, and the governor and I have had many discussions on that, but now it, you know, it, it is what it is. But it allows others to uh, fight against your system. I was against the red line underground system being the first system built in LA. I always thought it should be a system that went over right. And that's what my thesis said. They go straight down the um, 10 freeway. Right away was there, it was quicker, faster, cheaper than everyone who fell in love with it. We would have more money at that time. But, you know, uh, Mayor Bradley, the red line is where he wants to increase the ocean boulevard. Uh, it was cost prohibitive, and then we took the second route of going through uh, going through the uh, blue line now. Uh, but I felt that the governor did the right, um, uh, felt that he took the easy way out of the system to even have that. I mean, there's a lot of other things kind of went into that, um, but if you cut it across the line, it was simply a decision that is the easiest, quickest, uh, most efficient way. And he looked at the, we took a map and looked at the opposition at the time. Republicans that it went through their district, it went through four Democrats, uh, three Republicans, and everybody had the votes to do it. Not knowing that two of the Democrats switched on it, so I, I no longer want, uh, want the system. Um, but now he's got opposition from the lieutenant governor and others saying, you know, why are we wasting the money just to build that, build that system? So we still have some ways to go. Um, but, uh, but that's just something that we have to Thank you, Earl. It's really a wonderful presentation and wonderful discussion. Uh, I just want to compliment you on the, on the whole thing, but especially you know, you're referencing to the, the late Tom Brown. Uh, I was privileged to have him in our house at one time, working on the Democratic politics. And uh, a young labor lawyer, uh, so stressful. And he said, well, you know, we're all amateurs when it comes to politics. And I always I wanted to pass that on because I always thought that was a brilliant perspective and take on that question, response to that question. I agree Tom, with you. He was absolutely brilliant. Tom was a visionary. Tom indicated Mr. Bradley <coughs> that we would have gridlock Last question for the night. Um, thank you, Ronald. I'm uh, intrigued by the, the topic of fear that we've 
introduced, and I'm curious on the three examples that you gave. Number one, what would be, uh, what would you see kind of alternate scenario if there were there? What is kind of the bridge that could have existed for this project to be We were, we were hoping on that first project. Um, we saw this as a, this is the cross from the green line and the blue line. Can you talk about that project? Um, from the beginning of the design, we were, we were program managers on the blue line there. Uh, we were actually telling the MTA that you should create this hub around that station because they were going to design the blue line but that now should be totally redesigned with Caltrain because you know, it's a freeway. It's one of the freeway, you're running up under a freeway. And we felt at that time, if you collaborated with them, you can create this node there with uh, shops, with entertainment, with the development of the um, hospital that's there. We want to put medical uses around there to make it safe. Totally change that environment over there. Change the zoning of certain area there to make that a, that a <coughs> employment at the same time. Uh, that didn't take much. It just took people to say, hey, we have a vision to doing something in that area. We didn't do that. So what you had is, what you have right now is the green line going through an elevated system up there. You have the blue line down below, and you have them where you have to get off on one and cross the street and go to another. Who wants to be in that environment? I don't, and I'm from that area. I can't stand it. So how do you design that and change that? Um, Craig and Mark and others in the firm and us, we, we're, we're looking at ways to create uh, really a, a, a design solution that should have been a physical solution that would make a difference. And uh, they, they're not going to provide the kind of money that we really think that it takes for that. We've created a different environment in that area by creating uh, light sources and light wells and, and, and doing some really interesting architectural uh, uh, solutions to it. But the opportunity was missed in there years ago when we could have brought that whole area out, had a share station there, had a larger share station put there, had some retail there. The more people are around, the less crime. If you were able to mix those two together, it would have made your, uh, it would, it would, it would, it could make people get off of the system, the elevator and other uh, system process. But it was just poorly designed. I hate to say it was the worst design you could possibly have in terms of transportation. I mean, worse than the, you have a green line that doesn't even go to the airport, the biggest employer there. I mean, it was, it's one of those uh, worst design efforts. <laughs> El Segundo employees associated with it. Yeah. But, but that's, uh, yeah, but, but now we're, we're hopefully we're going to change that, but it's not going to be that way we can share that for the uh, design. But I think we, I think Craig and Mark and others have done a very good job with that. I would say it takes an enormous <coughs> amount of stamina to do your part to maintain and to continue to try to you know, bring the parties together to make it happen. And you know, many other people have given up a long time. So I you know, the stamina and the dedication I think is pretty amazing. Well we have to because we can't do work and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.